Hey guys, Ryan here. If you listen to the podcast on Apple, there is a very simple way for you to help out the show. Just click the Apple Premium subscriber button at the top of the feed, and you'll instantly become a premium member, where you get all the same rewards as our Patreon members do. Early access to all main episodes and bonus episodes and content. Join our Apple Premium subscription today, and thank you for your support. This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Hi, Ryan, and hello to all listeners of the Somewhere in the Skies podcast. My name is Taran, and I'm from Melbourne, Australia, which is known for a couple of um, incidents that have happened here, such as the Westall UFO and the disappearance of Frederick Valentich. Uh, I suggest look them up. They're very um, interesting stories. Uh, I'm going to touch on the Westall UFO thing later on because i do have something that is related to that um (laughs) so i've had two experiences and i'll start with the first one being in 2009 when i was 15 years old i was in year nine um it was on a saturday at 6 30 a.m i i i got up out of bed like something it felt like something was telling me to get up of bed and have a look out the window it's a bit strange. It's like someone was talking to me. I don't know. It's just that it was the first reaction I had. When I sat up, I could see this silver glimmering in the distance. And I looked at this thing and I thought, it's very shiny, whatever it is. Um, and I got up to have sort of like a more focused look at this thing. And what I could see was a silver disc. It's really shiny, like the shiniest thing I've ever seen. Um, planes aren't normally that shiny, you know. Um, normally in Australia we see a lot of white Cessnas that, you know, fly on by. Um, at the time I was living in Limbrook, which was sort of not countryside, but it was a residential area. Um, not many houses there, and. Um, Anyway, I could see this silver disc about, I would say, a kilometer away and about 300 meters in the air. And the size of it would have been not too big. Uh, It wouldn't have been that big. I reckon it was maybe 10 meters in diameter. And yeah, it was very odd because it was just slowly traveling across from the right to the left going at about my guess is maybe 15 kilometers an hour possibly less than that it was just cruising um and i went to sort of look around and see if anyone else was looking at it. no one was looking at it um couldn't see anyone on the street it was very quiet didn't hear any traffic didn't hear any noise from this thing you know, no no sound of rotors or, you know, helicopter blades or anything like that. Um, and I thought, it's very odd because this thing would have stalled if it was a plane. And then it goes diagonally. It's, it doesn't stop, but it sort of like stops going in that direction. And it goes right to the left. Then it goes back to the right by diagonally up. And then, as it goes diagonally up to the right, this ep- this whole thing would have been maybe a couple minutes. And as soon as it does that, 
this thing shoots off sort of up and away from where I am and goes into the clouds or it's heading to the clouds but then it does something very interesting it dematerializes I know that sounds strange right Um, you can look up the word but basically what I mean by that is as soon as it headed for the clouds it sort of pixelated it away is the best way to describe it pixelated away and it was gone like it was just a flash like it just decided I'm out of here um, and there was a it left a hole in the clouds um, where I was looking at this thing I found that very really strange I shared this story with a couple of people and you know they they want to explain it away and say it was a plane and explain why it wouldn't have been a plane um, but each their own you know I saw what I saw um, and then there was another instance that was even more um, astounding than this way more um, but I hold that moment dear to me because that made me sort of like a believer in things above what we see right now but the second um, instance was in 2013 I wanted to catch up with a friend of mine I've only been to his house once and I it was hard to get there because he lived pretty far away from me so I happened to be somewhere in Tyab and uh, there's an airport nearby there and uh, I was parking up and inputting uh, something on my GPS the coordinates to my friend's place because it was hard to get there and then um, as I'm doing this I happen to just look up I just looked at the night sky just felt like it and I could see these two white lights pretty far away I'd say about maybe 1.5 kilometers away from where I am um, which were what looked like definitely attached to a triangle like a black triangle a solid one and it looked big it looked like it was maybe 100 meters in diameter um, like I could see um, a black triangle sort of suspended in the air I could tell because the shade of it was different to the night sky it was just darker like a more obsidian black as opposed to night sky black and the the lights were on the corners of this thing and it was tilting as if it was in anti-gravity or something it was really weird it was just in the same spot but just sort of tilting like moving in on an axis, like it was rotating and as it was slowly slowly rotating um it took about five minutes for me to see uh, uh, the other corner of this triangle and there was another light on it so it was a light on each triangle there was no other lights it was that that's all i could see step out of the car to have a closer look and i actually took some photos of this thing um which i will send to you ryan as well along with this um recording of course and um yeah i i was looking at it with another gentleman who hopped out of his car and i said to him what do you think this is do you think it's military or maybe aliens or something or what do you think and he goes i don't want to say mate (laughs) he goes i don't i don't know i don't know what to make of it um it is strange though i'm trying to identify it i'm like so am i but i mean you can see it it's a triangle and he didn't disagree with me and he was he looked like he was too scared to comment he goes i'm gonna go so he he goes he keeps looking at it but he's really confused I call my friend and say, hey, can you see this thing? Um, I told him about what I was seeing, pointing him in the direction of where it was. And he said, yep, I can see it from my porch. Come over. We need to talk. Like, we need to talk about this thing. So I go over and we could both see it. And his mum is also looking at it too. And we're trying to figure out what it is. And while I was with him, I googled... Um, black triangle UFO came up with TR3B um, which is in relation to you can see some images of a Belgium 
UFO, which are pretty crazy uh, if they're real. It, I don't know. I think it's real to me. Well, I, I saw a black triangle in the sky. It was very odd. Very hard to explain. It says it's military technology that we reverse engineered. Um, but yeah, how do we reverse engineer it? <laughs> yeah, that, that was a very crazy instance for me. But then also, my partner, um, she had a very interesting experience that um, I think sort of relates to the Wessel UFO incident. Um, if you don't know about it, look it up. 200 people from a school saw a UFO land in a field nearby. That includes kids and teachers who drew diagrams. But yeah, my partner actually went to uh, West uh, Westall's uh, primary school. She went there and um, she was in line to go to a class um, and she was at the front in front of a teacher and the teacher um, was getting the students ready to go inside there were kids playing the, uh, on the playground and there was like laughing you know all kinds of commotion going on as they're getting ready my partner sort of looks looks away for a bit and then as she looks to the front the teacher's gone she looks behind her the kids are gone everyone was gone the noise just stopped at this point she freaks out you know um, she was five years old um, very scared very confused didn't know what to do and sort of like looked around and called to see if anyone was there is anyone there and no one was there so then she um, decides to go into the building and check where her class was and as she arrives there everyone's in the class so the really strange thing is literally in one second everyone's gone it's like five ten minutes have disappeared and she's watching her very own class um, and she felt like something else happened in that in that time but she doesn't know what you know she doesn't know whether it's time travel whether she got abducted it is bizarre it is really bizarre and I actually said to her that may have happened so she's going to see a hypnotherapist for that and we'll see if we can find out what happened there but I said to her I feel like it does relate to the Wessel UFO thing and that's because um, what I believe in is there are certain areas in the world where a lot of strange things happen you know I feel like there are certainly interdimensional pockets um, war poles if you will that we cannot see with the naked eye that filters and let these things in I feel that UAP, UFO related phenomena are interdimensional. Um, that's why we don't see them all the time. We'll only see them sometimes. But have a look around the world. Everyone's seen something. You know, have a look at these hearings that are happening. This stuff is real. You know, um, I've been a believer for a long time, um, despite the skepticism, despite what people have said. I kept it mainly to myself. However, I didn't see the point of doing that when you've got so many people speaking out. You know, uh, for me, the first big one was Bob Lazar and Element 118. Like, you can't predict that in the 80s. And the fact that his employee record was sort of wiped away, but then there's still traces of it. <laughs> you know, there's... there's there's a lot of evidence of brushing this under the carpet uh, as opposed to there not being uh, such a thing as um, UAPs, UFOs, aliens, extraterrestrials, that sort of thing. I mean, who are we to try and um, sort of remove that those theories? How can we? There's just too many people that have seen it heard it um 
too much is going on, you know. And people like George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell are really trying to show everyone what's going on. Ross Coulter from Australia, which is awesome. I'm glad that my country's involved in this um, in, you know, a positive light. I guess what helps me keep on going is topics like this, this sort of fascination, um, the things that keep me sort of exhilarated. You know, I stay up late at night watching documentaries on this stuff. It's just so fascinating, you know, Um, not because we could have brothers and sisters out there. It means something more. It explains it could be the very foundation of our existence and I want to know the answer to that um, even if I'm ready for it or not it's that curiosity it's the biggest question in the universe in in my universe at least but um, anyway thank you for letting me share my story and uh, I hope this gives um, everyone else who hasn't disclosed their story to have the confidence to do so um, because our minds are a lot more open now so I say go for it get it off your chest it'll make you feel better and anyway I just wanted to say thank you Brian for letting me share uh, my testimony and uh, my witness accounts thank you and have a good night all day wherever you are on Earth or in the universe. (laughs) Hey Ryan, thanks a lot for taking my experience into consideration. First of all, I want to make a brief introduction about who I am. My name is Bogdan, but you can call me Dan. I'm from a small town in northern Romania and I'm 18 years old. Since I was very, very young, I always had this interest towards space exploration, extraterrestrial research, and almost anything related to science and mystery. But this pleasure of mine was determined by my father, who was very intrigued by those phenomenons, and he always tried to find an answer and to solve them. And his attitude towards the matter determined me to become as well a researcher. Now, it wasn't only the influence of my dad who brought me here. You know, in Romania we have a saying that says what you're afraid of, that's what you don't escape from. It was early 2010, I can't remember the month exactly, but it was definitely winter. Around 8 o'clock in the evening, my mother was coming from work and my dad was watching out the window after her, but he was also admiring the night sky as he was always doing. At the same time, he was also talking to me about school, homework and other family related stuff. At some point I asked him something and I got no answer. I asked again, again and again, and there, was, and there was no answer at all. When I went in the room where he was, I saw him watching the sky, but in a way I've never seen before. He was completely frozen. In that moment, he stated something that I will never forget. Come here, son, to see something that even I can believe I just witnessed. And that was the moment I have seen it. What looked like a disc with a diameter of a one dollar coin was floating in the sky. It had no sound, it was completely still and had this orange-yellowish color, but what was bizarre was the fact that the color was like being reflected. It was like watching the sun, but of course it didn't have that same intensity. We watched it for about 2 or 3 minutes straight. It stood in the exact same position all this time. 
After a while, its intensity started to lower, but very very slowly, and the decrease of its size was concentric, so I think it was rising. At this moment, this could be described as an UAP, but what comes next is really unexplainable. From this gentle lift of the phenomena, it suddenly disappeared in a blink of eye. I can't see even today that moment, and what was intriguing about this disappearance was the fact it didn't disappear the way it was lifting like concentric, it made this circular arc on the sky, for the lack of a better word, like a drift movement, a sort of a incredible acceleration. But even with all of this, there was no sound at all. What I felt in that moment can be described otherwise than what you would feel when you would meet ancient gods. Unfortunately, in Romania, the people are very reluctant to extraterrestrial life, so I kept this incident as classified as possible. I've only talked about it with my uncle, who is an expert in electronics and mechanics, and of course with my father. But as a matter of fact, this is not all what I witnessed. I had a more severe incident, but I won't talk about it here, only if Ryan would like to have a discussion about it on a private call, because of safety reasons and to make sure it stays as classified as possible. Until then, thanks a lot for taking my experience into consideration. Wish you all the best. The Somewhere in the Skies podcast is free to listen to every week, but if you would like to help support the show, we have a very active Patreon page where you give what you think the show is worth. In return, you'll get early access to the main show, bonus episodes, and priority to ask our guests your listener questions. Your support truly makes the show continue and grow. So, to learn more and to join, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. Hi Ryan, my name is Emmanuel Roach and I would like to relate to you a few incidences that I believe I've had with UAP slash UFOs and a possible extraterrestrial encounter. So, a little bit of background on me. I grew up in a small filling fishing village in Tor Bay, Newfoundland, which is on the easternmost province uh, in Canada, out on the North Atlantic. And my first experience with a UAP, UFO, would have been approximately when I was six or seven years old. So this would have been 1976, 1977, around Christmas time. So I remember looking out our front window of our house uh, across town as we were up on a ridge and I could see clear across to the other side of town and it was approximately 10 11 o'clock and I remember looking out and I could see the lights the housing lights on the other side of town and up in the sky I distinctly remember seeing three bright lights and looked like a searchlight was shining down towards the ground, but it was on a 45 degree angle. The lights were stationary and the spotlight seemed to be an intense white light, almost in a conical shape. So I watched these lights for about five, 10 minutes, still weren't moving. And being a six to seven year old, detention span of a bug I turned away and was watching something on TV for I'm guessing 10 or 15 minutes and I turned around to look out the window again and the lights were gone so the next incident that happened to me I'm going to say that it happened a short period of time later because I was around the same age 
and I remember being in my bedroom and I remember waking up at night sometime during the night and I had this distinct feeling that I was being watched so I looked at the door to my bedroom and I saw what looked to be two creatures they were probably about four feet tall around my height maybe I was a little taller but from what I remember they were a grayish color I couldn't really see their face but they were standing in the door looking at me and then I don't remember anything else after that so fast forward quite a few quite a few years later and I'm now serving in the Canadian Army so I just recently retired after 27 years of service and early on in my career uh, I was at a training exercise in CFB Gage Town which is in New Brunswick it's one of the larger army bases in Canada and this is what happened around 1990 so we were out on the training ranges watching a lot watching a live fire demonstration and at that time Loring Air Force Base was still open and we participated in joint exercises with the Americans uh, this particular summer so as part of the live fire demonstration uh, B-52 came in and dropped some ordnance on the training ranges and if you've ever seen a B-52 flying low level it's quite an impressive sight and then on top of that having ordnance being dropped it shook the ground literally that being said about probably 30 seconds to a minute later a black orb followed the trail of the B-52 to me it looked like a black dot uh, it was hard to gauge what size it was as the B-52 was approximately five to six kilometers away from where we were so I'm gonna say that dot was probably 30 to 40 feet in dimension and it moved very fast from east to west now in my career I know what military aircraft look like specifically fighters and attack aircraft I know what helicopters look like and civilian aircraft this was neither it was a round object black and moved very fast so we didn't think too much of it at that time we're like oh what the hell was that so we thought it might have just been a military aircraft that we weren't aware of so later on that day as we were closing up the ranges and pulling out to go back to our bivouac site we heard helicopters coming in now at that time the range was still closed to aircraft so it was strange to hear helicopters flying in our vicinity so we happened to look up and there were three UH-60 Black Hawk helicopters now we know what these helicopters look like as we've trained with them before and they were an olive drab color at that time these particular helicopters, three of them, were painted black. I mean like midnight black. And they were flying low and slow over the training area. So they started out close to us and moved out into the training area, almost around the area where the B-52 had traveled. So we never thought too much of this. Like, okay, maybe they were looking for some equipment that had been lost which wasn't unusual at that time. So we get back to our bivouac site and we were called in for a debriefing. We were asked what we saw on the ranges when the B-52 flew by and when we saw the three helicopters. So I gave my statement and never heard anything of it um, since then. And then fast forward again, I'm now retired from the military and I'm living in eastern Ontario in the town of Napanee and this would have happened around November 2022 at the height of the pandemic I was out on my deck my front deck and I was taking my dogs out 
and I happened to look up into the sky. So where I live, we're in the flight path from Pearson International Airport for inbound and outbound flights going to Europe. So prior to the pandemic, we were getting flights every 10 to 15 minutes flying over my house. During the pandemic, there was barely any air traffic. So it was unusual from what I seen and it made me think about what I had actually witnessed. So I'm looking south over Lake, towards Lake Ontario to the east and I see this red light moving from west to east. And I didn't think too much about it at the time because we were close to a large air, air base, CFB Trenton, and it wasn't unusual now and again to see military aircraft transiting close to where I live. What made this strange was that I saw another red light trailing the first red light. Thinking, hmm, okay, that's a bit odd. And then to make matters even stranger, there was a, threat, a third red light. This third red light was playing tag, it seemed, with the first and second lights. It would speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down, and then the second light decided to do a complete loop around the first light, and then the third light was continuing to go forward and backwards. And then it stopped. The first and second light continued on. The third light stayed stationary, and then zoomed up towards the first and second light. And now all three of them were playing this cat and mouse game, going back and forth, back and forth. This happened probably for 30 seconds to a minute, and then poof, they were gone. I've never seen anything before like this, and I've never seen anything since. Now, where I live, we're starting to see a lot more satellite activity in our area. Sometimes when I look up, I'm not sure if it's a satellite. I've seen one or two things that gave me a little bit of a pause. Hmm, satellites don't normally do a jerky motion, like they'll move it, surge ahead, slow down, surge ahead, slow down. So I'm not sure if I may have seen something else, but who knows. But anyway, Ryan, that's my story. And... Hello, fellow Somewhere in the Skies listeners. My name is Tad Rhodes, reporting from New Zealand with an account of a close encounter that took place in 1989. I was 26 years old at the time and kept the event pretty much to myself until recently when I felt compelled to write a true short story and put it out into the world. So here it is. Aiding and abetting the phenomenon. Epigraph. Perhaps by engaging our psyche, they pass the burden of their arrival onto our collective shoulders, Mac Tonys. As was our wont in our younger days, Sarah and I were roaming through the quiet backwaters of Britain. Travelling light with trail by content, we often found landowners who graciously gave us permission to lodge overnight. On one such stopover, found us setting up camp in the centre of a recently harvested crop field. Noticing a layer of stubble strewn around a nearby island of trees, we used this to cushion the tent and turn a ground sheet into a divan. With preparations made for a comfortable night, we set off for Stratford, the aim being to take in a play at the theatre. Luckily, we were able to get tickets for the evening performance of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Later, leaving town, we rode out into our own Midsummer Night, flying through narrow lanes thick with cool night air. A final trundle across the farmyard and past outhouses took us down into the fields and back to base. We made tea and sat on the divan under clear skies, looking out on the countryside patchwork. Bedtime nearing, Sarah began to shut up shop while I did a bit of stargazing. This was when things began to get very weird. Prone and relaxed, my eyes became more adapted to the dark. One, then two new layers of fainter stars revealed themselves. Unexpectedly, this effect continued and began to take a grip. 
I started to successively see and slowly penetrate through deeper and deeper star grids. As this state amplified, a slither of my consciousness became located with the new frontier of my awareness, far into space. Returning to Earth, mildly stunned, but none the worse for wear, I stood up. The atmosphere around us had changed. Time was passing a beat slower. There was a sense of things being more gravid, like the hush and dimming of lights in the theatre. My attention was drawn to the nearby island of trees, now beset by growing shadow. Fairy lights blinked between the limbs. Surely not. Perhaps these lights were actually a way off. We had a do-you-see-what-I-see moment, with Sarah confirming. She could see them too. The scintillating display of cobalt, ivory, sienna and crimson jewels became increasingly fascinating. Time slowed a beat more. Dark nebulous shapes began to sway the lights, taking form within the lattice of tree limbs. An impossible something was slowly coalescing and materialising. Looking back now, a children's joke comes to mind. How do elephants hide in the forest? They paint their toenails red and hide in the cherry trees. I start debunking avidly. It must be house lights in the distance, or just the shadows, etc. This doesn't last long. There is something big gaining solidity behind the trees, but I can't or won't take it in. I feel it probing for a gestalt that closer matches its desired shape. Apparently, we need to agree on the direction this manifestation is taking. After a few more negotiations, there is a dramatic resolution. Although I know it now to be fully present, I stubbornly refuse to see it, or perhaps I just can't take it in yet. Oh, I can see it. The Cheshire Cat is out of the bag. A fully formed craft is rising just above the trees. I could hit it with a proverbial rock. I don't want to be here. I don't want it to be there, but there it is. A matte black polyhedron the size of a double-decker bus. The flashy lights are incorporated into its outer shell. The final form we agreed on is a giant D20 Dungeon and Dragons die. Never played the game. Go figure. Over yonder fields, a troop of white SUVs are coming our way. The top half of these show above the hedge line. But no, not SUVs. As they zigzag closer, they resolve into smooth, domed craft. Each boxy unit hovers close to the ground, emitting a slanting beam of light. Reeling from these outlandish events, it sinks in that this is a UFO encounter. I never imagined it would be like this. It's like participating in an outdoor theatrical magic show spectacular. Not like something out of Close Encounters. Well, perhaps a bit like Close Encounters if the director was Alistair Crowley. A spooky and indifferent quasi-technological presence has taken the opportunity to pull off an audacious stunt. A vile transgression of the natural order of things, if you ask me. Getting even busier out there now. Two pearlescent orbs, the size of beach balls, traverse the hedgerows with a moth-like motion of a hunting barn owl. One passes out of sight behind me on the left, then the other on the right. This causes alarm, which I use to mentally recoil from the ongoing mesmerism. Suddenly more aware, feeling like a lab rat introduced to a cat. From somewhere ancient, trite-seeming factoids bubble to the surface. This is the other. Always been happening, like this. Just not to you. Best to leave the area if you want to be safe. Okay, it's time to act like a shepherd and get the flock out of here. I turn to Sarah, who's in a trance. Shaking her out of this, 
I ask her to get my lock knife from the tent. This done, we beat a hasty retreat up the slope towards the outhouses, ending up alongside a corral containing two agitated donkeys. While their wickering fades, we watch the now purposeful antics below. The pale domed things seem to be executing a reconnaissance mission in yonder field. Taking their own good time, each completes their part of a wide grid search. The orbs are displaying a lot of interest in power lines, particularly the lattice towers. Jumbo D20 is smugly levitating above the island of trees, body panels absorbing light, still pimping its ride with twinkling fairy lights. Thankfully, after a while, this band of cosmic mummers meanders far away. Short-lived relief, huh? As two more craft with flashing lights appear far off in the opposite direction. Oh, once again, I wish this was not happening. This is too much action for one night. As the two craft speed towards us, they start to admit the familiar sound of jet engines. Hallelujah. Two fighter jests pass rapidly in front of us and start to converge on the distant D-20. On their approach, D-20 zips upward at a 35 degree angle, disappearing out of sight in an eye blink. The jets are left in the dust. Without conversation, we walk back to camp and get into our sleeping bags. The following morning, Packing down and loading the bike, surprisingly, we don't mention the previous night's events. But at a staging point later in the day, we do confer, agreeing we both saw the same strange happenings. Leaving it all behind, we get on with the rest of our trip and the rest of our lives, once in a blue moon wondering, what were those visitors? Where did they come from? And what the hell were they doing? You ask where I stand now in relation to the event? Well, the what and why are still a mystery. All I can say is that it was an encounter with one particular variety of the phenomenon that seemed to be weaving in from another dimension or reality. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to share my story, Ryan. Much appreciated. Somewhere in the Skies is produced by Third Kind Productions in association with the Entertainment One Podcast Network.